everyone. My name is Barry Miles Cohen. I'm the Senior Director of the Women's Programs Office at the American Psychological Association. And although I'm disappointed to have to stop Marvin Gaye, I am delighted to serve as your moderator for this session entitled Raising Resilient Children with Shanika Argo. Shanika Argo is a licensed professional counselor and supervisor who founded her private practice, Points of Origin LLC. She is a Greenville-based clinician from Kansas who began serving the community through mental health in 2008. Shamika attended the University of North Carolina, where she obtained a Bachelor of Science in Psychology with female concentration. In the years since obtaining a master's degree from Webster University, she has found that her time working inpatient in the community as a school-based therapist and in private practice is something not to be taken for granted. It has more than grown her professional passion to teach others to be unapologetic in the love we have for ourselves that drives her as a therapist. This passion also led Shamika to work to become a licensed supervisor. Additionally, she offers a monthly parenting group in the newly launched United to Serve Parenting, Survival is a Mess. That encourages members to join together. Uh -huh. Thank you, Shanika, for being here. How are you this afternoon? I am good. I'm good. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I'm well. I'm so pleased that we're going to be able to have this conversation today. Yes, I'm excited to be here. And I wanted to just sort of jump right in and ask you about resiliency in children and to what um, I'm a mom, I've got a 13 year old. Um, and so what does a resilient child look like? A resilient child actually I, I was thinking about this while I was waiting for us to kind of come on and, and the first thing that came to mind is that your resilient child really looks like the child that we all wish that we had, you know, when you're thinking about having kids or, you know, what kind of person is my kid going to be. It's the kind of kid that really is going to make parenting easy. It's the kind of kid that you're going to, you know, enjoy spending time with. They're not going to embarrass you having a fit in the middle of Walmart. That, that's a resilient child. It's the ideal child that we all kind of imagine having. One that really, you know, they talk to us before they go and, you know, break the rules. So really, it's about um, them being able to feel confident in communicating their feelings feeling confident in, you know, the fact that you're going to listen when they're telling you something and they feel, you know, they have this emotional intelligence about them to the point where they don't need to have a fit or cry. They can simply come to you and, you know, and pour it all out to you and expect that if they are asking for help, that you're actually going to be able to help them with it and not only help them with it, but not do it for them. So that's definitely a big part of raising a resilient child is simply letting them explore these things and build that confidence and without expecting you to do it for them. And so we all, well, those of us who are parents have all had children have a fit in the Walmart. <laughs> so how do you practice resiliency in parenting? Resiliency in parenting? Well, I think that a lot of the whole, the, the parenting component, a big part of it is the parent themselves we were talking about mental health all day long, but the parent themselves being able to function on their focus on their own mental well-being, it definitely starts there. So a good part of it is, you know, being aware of how am I showing up for my kid? How is my behavior and the decisions that I make maybe impacting them or what is it teaching them? And so a lot of, you know, being able to, to do that is not only focusing on yourself, but what am I doing when I'm interacting with my kid? Am I actually spending time with them? Am I doing things that, that they like? Am I listening to them? And when they're bringing me this fifth drawing of this heart, how am I responding? Am I throwing it away? Am I saying, okay, yeah, I'll look at it later. What am I doing to engage and interact with my kid and actually helping them to flourish as an individual? Mm -hmm. And um, and so what so we started talking a little bit about how we can support the development of resiliency in children and mm -hmm. what are some other ideas you have some other, suggestions? some other ideas that i have so a big part of it is for instance um not again i said something about i'm um, not doing it for them a lot of times for instance one thing that i've i'm guilty of in the past is if i am in a rush and trying to leave in the morning and i'm like you know go put on your shoes 
I have found in the past that my kid all of a sudden he's like I don't know how to put on my shoes I don't even know where my shoes are and so it, our instant response or reaction is okay okay well let me get your shoes for you let me put them on you when when we're talking about developing resiliency what's a more appropriate response instead is okay let's let's walk through this let me calm myself down mm -hmm. is it really important for us to leave in the next two minutes will the world end if we leave in five generally the answer is no so let me help my kid come up with a solution let me support him and you know in his confidence in this moment and his ability to actually problem solve this very simple solution in finding your shoes and putting them on so it really has a lot to do with that dialogue and that emotional support that the adults are able to provide for the children and there are lots of different ways to do that um, and it's really it has a lot to do with like how are we going to provide consequences are we going to do punishment are we going to spank are we going to yell are we going to scream or are we going to sit down and say hey can you tell me what's going on here mm -hmm. what, what, which part are you, which part are you struggling with can you show me what you did before you got to this point and what do you think might work instead of saying hey back to the shoes example just put your shoes in the same spot every single time and you won't have to look for them if we if we go back and we you know are able to maintain our own mental health and even it's in balance and walk them through these problems not only does it teach them that i am here to support you but i am confident in your ability to solve this you don't actually need me here you don't but because you think you do what can i do to support you in being successful here and so what do you think about the difference between boys and girls in building resilience do you think there's any I am, um, I don't know, I was, I was a tomboy for, uh, for a good little time, so I don't know if I'm the best person to ask you know, without going into the research, but um, in general, I don't think that there is a big difference because I'm also a person who says speak to the individual because I don't think we can necessarily categorize them and say, oh, you're a girl, so this is going to work for you. You're a boy, so this is going to work for you. And when we're talking about resilience, that's not important anyway. It's really about who is this kid as, a, as an individual? Who are they naturally? And what can I do to help them feel confident in that person and confident in sharing that person with the world? And not only sharing that person with the world, but responding to adversity when maybe someone decides that they don't like them or when someone decides to um, treat them in a very unhelpful or unhealthy way. How am I going to help my kid be prepared to bounce back and keep their cool? And it really does. It's not just we do one thing, we do it one time. It's all day, every day. If your kid is asking a question, the best thing you can do is actually answer it. And so um, I'm sure you've been reading and seeing the images from Minnesota. On mm -hmm. and, um, and so I'm asking this question as a mom, right? Because uh -huh. my 16 year old boy looks like he's 16 years old. Mm -hmm. He has the, um, you know, sort of the mentality of a, of a child, right? So folks in the community don't necessarily see him that way. They see him as a 16 or 17 year old and sort of describe that maturity to him. Um, so mm -hmm. think about what's happening in Minnesota and the conversations we need to have with our children around sort of resilience. Uh -huh. start that. Again, if they're asking questions, answer them. Mm -hmm. be, be, be mindful. I, I like the facts, but I also like, like to, um, again, get them to ask me questions and answer them appropriately. Because one big thing, again, about building resilience in the children is the whole, how is the parent processing this? And whether or not the parent is going to project their own fears and their own anxieties onto the kid in their response. And so that is a major part. So one of the best ways to actually manage that, again, is to pour back into the kid by seeing what's even bothering them. Because the things that might be bothering us as a parent may not be an issue for them. But also on the flip side of that, as a parent, it's also our job to prepare them for the world. And one of the things that I love about kids and why I think that I will always work with kids, I actually have three of them running around my house right now, is that they have not been tainted by the world. They are so beautiful in their ability to be very aware without having the anxieties and the pressures that the world and even, you know, society and their parents and their friends actually put on them. So I think it really goes back to figuring out why are they asking these questions of me? What is it that they actually want to know? Are they actually afraid? Are they concerned? How aware 
are they of their own skin and the effect that it has? Because for instance, um, I mentioned in the, uh, in my bio that I'm from Kansas. And so in being from Kansas and being raised next to the military base and having, you know, biologically only half siblings, that one of the things that my mom did amazingly was that's not your half sister. That's not your half brother. That is your sister. And that is your brother. And that person is not black, brown, or purple. That is a person. And so that's one thing that I try to even instill in my son. And one, one of the reasons why, you know, I'm really vibing with my green hair. It doesn't really matter what you look like. It's are you going to be able to focus on what people are bringing to the table, how they are benefiting you, and not only how they're benefiting you, but how are you benefiting them? And so when we're, we're talking about a lot of the things that's going on in society, again, on the flip side, as a parent, how do I prepare my child to also be safe? Mm-hmm. And, and also be mindful and also be mindful that not only can you not control what other people do, but you absolutely can control what you do. And so being a self-aware is a big part of this resilience. And it's a big part of being able to kind of function in this world. Um, and then also not only that, I know I mentioned um, responsibilities. One thing that I think people struggle with drastically is uh, accepting responsibility for others, other people's actions and things like that. So for instance, a lot of us feel very emotionally charged by a lot of things that are going out in the unit, going on in the, in the world. And there are lots of things that we can do. But if we're going back to tie it back to resilience, are we going to stay home and stay in our feelings? Or are we going to actually find a way to take action, to shift these things? And so I think that a lot of you know, in answering your question, it's how do we empower our children to have an impact? How do we empower our children to have an impact in a way that is not going to not only negatively affect them, but that they are going to be mindful and aware of how is it helping people and what am I okay with? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's a really, there's a, there's a lot of things that we could say here and talk about here as far as how do we prepare our children. But I think a big part of it is teaching them to not necessarily not see differences, but to acknowledge differences and learn to appreciate them and learn to not sit in the shadows and instead, you know, work to incite change, work to gather people, work to teach people, work to be okay with people exactly the way that they are. And what sorts of opportunities have you uh, made? Well, how old are your children first, I guess? It depends on which children you're talking about. Okay. I have one biological child and he will be seven here in a few weeks, but I have somewhat of a blended family. And so if I include everybody, yeah. um, I've got about five. Okay. And they range uh-huh. in age. Yes. The, the youngest one is um, five and then the oldest one is 15. Okay. So, mm-hmm. what is asking, so for me, my son has a group of friends that he has had since he was four years old. They were his preschool friends and we started mm-hmm. a club for them. Mm-hmm. We meet once a month, they've read a book, one boy leads the discussion, and they've done this since they were um, eight years old. Mm-hmm. And it has helped them um, to learn about other people, learn about all the other cultures, mm-hmm. and also to develop leadership skills and things like that. Mm-hmm. Are there other examples you could recommend to our listeners about um, ways to help children find ways to have an impact in their communities, to, um, to learn those sorts of leadership skills um, from a young age, but also all the way up to 15 and beyond. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really think um, a big part of that is exposure and, and feeling confident in being able to kind of problem solve and, and then just their abilities within themselves. But one of the things that I think that we struggle with is a lot of the information that we get is very much so filtered Mm-hmm. And people are not actually going out and having these experiences and seeing these things firsthand. So I would definitely say that it has a lot to do with challenging our own level of discomfort and going out and having experiences, talking to people, finding ways to identify with them. And, and back to the whole resilience in childhood, you know, having experiences, period, is one of the best ways that you can develop that resiliency and make an impact. And when we're having these experiences, the people that are around us, it's their job really to allow us to have those and be able to provide that support. And even if, you know, even if I have this weird and crazy idea, being able to say, hey, go check it out. 
try it out instead of, oh, that's scary. Don't do that. I don't know why you would do that. You may get hurt. Okay, well, if there's a potential for harm, let's look at that too. What can we do to have an impact so that it is more than likely to work in our favor? And how can we prepare for maybe the things that might be unknown? What may come of this and how can we get around that barrier so we can still accomplish this goal? And so we can look at areas of like competence, confidence, um, coping, um, control, character, you know, all of these words and, and back to the home base, what are we doing to foster those areas so that we are feeling more confident as an individual and as a whole to gather some people with us and go out and incite change and not give up at that because that's really what resiliency is, is how are we going to bounce back when something maybe doesn't go our way mm -hmm. or when we're triggered or when we kind of feel stuck. How long are we going to sit there before we are able to acknowledge our feelings and shift them to the side so we can continue to progress and accomplish a goal, a shared goal, a plan, create a plan? How long are we going to sit before we bounce back? So it really, I think, goes back to actually having these experiences and being in an environment where not only are those experiences encouraged, but they are supported and they are not um, looked at as like weird or crazy mm -hmm. or radical. They are mm -hmm. simply, okay, this is the thought that you have. Let's look at it. Let's, let's talk about it. What do you need? Do you need some time alone? What is it? Because mm -hmm. I really want you to, to understand that not only is your view, imp is it, not only is your view important, but this is how change happens. Mm -hmm. People are willing to, you know, shake and do some things. Right. You know, change doesn't happen from sitting down and laying down. It doesn't happen from not ruffling feathers. It just doesn't. Right. And so I think that a lot of what's going on in the environment really discourages people from, from ruffling feathers. Mm -hmm. You know, even in telling people how we feel sometimes, we're so concerned about how they're going to respond. Mm -hmm. Are they still going to like me? Are they still going to be my friend? Well, if you're really concerned about that, maybe that's not the right fit for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can you recommend some age appropriate sort of resilience building um, opportunities or activities for kids? Mm -hmm. um, really, again, that's back to an individual basis because it really talks about um, the individual kid and what are they interested in. So I always recommend having that bonding relationship with your child and exploring what they are interested in and doing it with them. So for my kid, he loves to draw. Mm -hmm. So we sit down and we draw a lot. And what I will do is I will challenge him to try something new because we oftentimes get stuck in, in repetition. So we often will take turns. And because obviously I'm older, I've had different experiences. The things that naturally come to my mind don't come to his, but I'm able to mm -hmm. share that with him and challenge him and in turn also work to build his confidence and his willingness to try new things. For someone who enjoys sports, being able to, you know, maybe research a new skill or a new technique would be awesome mm -hmm. um, to, to go out. Okay, so you like basketball. Well, this is this sport is very similar to basketball. Let's talk about what's comparable and let's try that one too. Mm -hmm. and, it, and then being okay if they don't like it. What I like is I say, you know, discomfort, try anything three try anything new three times. Mm -hmm. So even if it doesn't feel comfortable the first time, if you challenge yourself to do it again two more times, all right, maybe that one wasn't for you. Um, so it really could look drastically different depending on what the kid is. Um, the oldest one, um, he actually recently, he loves art too. Mm -hmm. And so he, he went down this, you know, shoe designing venture uh, not too long ago. Mm -hmm. Something that just, you know, popped into his head. So let's do it. What do you need? What do you need? Let, let's explore this. We've got, okay, so even if it's like a financial thing, set aside, you know, 20, 30, $50. This is what I can comfortably do to support you in exploring this new idea of yours. So I think it really goes back to the individual and in trying to help them feel comfortable and confident in who they are and exploring that with them and giving them the space to do that. So is it, is it, does it all go back to your mom and helping you develop resiliency and how she raised you with your brothers and sisters and everything? Else? So I, I, I can say yes, but I also think that some people are innately, naturally more resilient than others. Mm 
-hmm. And so you can definitely build this. um, But I do think that some people are naturally more resilient. And you think about like the impact of the environment as well. I know I mentioned um, growing up next to a military base. And so I had lots of exposure to different types of people and different lifestyles from a very young age. And so I would say that I was also very receptive to the things that were going on around me. And that's something that you can even foster in children who are not naturally like that. And one thing that you can do is simply just ask them questions. And again, take them out for these experiences and have them explore. And if they are saying, okay, well, I'm interested in this, even though you're ready to move on to the next activity, okay, I can give them five minutes (laughs) and let them have that five minutes to explore read it with them, ask them questions. And then, I mean, there's a, a big part of it is also like verbal contracts because I know I've talked about a lot about the parents kind of being mindful of who they are, but it's not just, well, this is what my kid needs, so let me be that person. That's not fair to the parent. That's where the verbal contracts come in. That's where, okay, well, um, I actually am ready to move on to the next activity. But since you want to look at this a little bit longer, do you think five minutes will be enough time for you to get what you need from, from this particular activity. Mm-hmm. And so that is another, that's one of the things I mentioned earlier, control. That gives the child the illusion of having some control and how their life is being directed in, in making these decisions. That is going to help them build resilience. Because if we're talking about going out and inciting change, they actually have to feel like they are capable of changing something mm-hmm. or else they won't start. And so it really goes back to a lot of these interactions that we have had beforehand. Change doesn't start in the moment. It starts way before that. Same thing with resilient. We don't automatically just find out we're resilient because we've been challenged. We've been resilient way before that point. And so this, this thing of this magic thing about parenting is we don't ever really get to sleep. We are, we are always on the job. We are always building these adults. You know, they, they might be five or 13 today, but they will be an adult someday. And if I have not worked to prepare them for that person, I'm not really doing the best I can in parenting them. Mm-hmm. And what resources are available to parents in your community? As far as um, helping to build resilience in your kids. I mean, not, not everyone um, is, um, sort of has the temperament, right, that you, uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. you said is, is important to be able to sort of sit still for a minute and, and listen. Uh-huh. We are uh-huh. all now telecommuting, most of us are. Um, yes. Are, or even if we're not, we are um, concerned about health issues, uh-huh. and family health issues, and um, continuing to have enough money to pay our bills and all of those things. So in situations like that, what are Mm -hmm. suggestions you have for folks? So adults can work on resiliency too. (laughs) And we've talked, I mean, again, we're talking about mental health today, being able to focus on your mental health. And we've talked a lot about um, who we are naturally being okay. So that's mm-hmm. definitely one thing that I would suggest that any and everybody does when they are feeling challenged is kind of one thing that I talk about, again, in the office, um, I'm a therapist as well, is we, I talk a lot about putting things on the table and not allowing it to kind of permeate your heart space. Mm-hmm. And so really the process before that is trying to figure out exactly, okay, so I've been triggered. What is it about this thing that is leading me to feel this way? And if you can get to that point and validate the emotions, because really I feel that that's all emotions want. They want to be validated. Generally, once you validate your emotions and say, okay, yes, I feel sad or I feel angry right now, Mm -hmm. that's okay. They will usually get out of your way. Those emotions, they will easily just move to the side and they will leave the remaining parts on the table. At that point, it's like a puzzle. How can I sort this out? So if we're talking about mental health and, you know, what can the adults do is, really pay attention to who you are, what's going on with you, provide yourself with mercy and go out and have experiences with your kid. If you are feeling that way, it's very possible they are too. Mm -hmm. Go out and do something with that energy. Whether it's again, trying out, I've I've been here 10 years and I still still use my GPS. I don't know what we have in the city because I didn't go in the city. (laughs) But there are definitely lots of different um, places where we can still go and explore. I've got lots of places that I know I can explore in the city, but having those experiences, checking in with yourself, 
and providing yourself with th that grace to say, it's okay for me to feel this way. I feel this way for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yes, this feels yucky. Yes, I wish I was able to do this. Yes, I wish I was able to walk. Or I wish I was able to, to go to work. I wish I had more money. Well, you can generally, you know, in most cases, um, survive on the amount of money that you are able to bring in. Unfortunately, sometimes that means, okay, well, this thing I really like, but I don't need it. Mm -hmm. And by having it, I am causing stress to myself. And subsequently, I'm yelling at my kid mm -hmm. because they're getting on my nerves and they show me this, this fifth heart for this, the 10th time today. I can't do that right now. Mm -hmm. And so what is it about the situation that's leading me to feel this way? Mm -hmm. I feel stressed because I don't have enough money. Okay, what is it about that that's leading me to feel this way? I am overspending. Mm -hmm. I'm not making enough money. Okay, so what do I need? What don't I need? What is flexible? And even in some situations, what can wait two weeks to be paid? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there are lots of different things that we can do here, but it goes back to, okay, checking in with myself. Mm -hmm. I don't like the way I feel right now. Can I break down a few things that I think is going on in there? And what can I do to kind of not necessarily clean it up, but put it in the appropriate spot. So mm -hmm. now I'm able to do something with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would also suggest that folks reach out to their support network. Right? Absolutely, um, absolutely. So what sorts of, um, how can women who are isolated, so who maybe don't have a support network, new to a community, haven't lived there for very long, what recommendations do you have for them for how they might go about building that sort of network? When you say isolated, what are you referring to? Um, maybe they're new to a community, so they don't have, they haven't met any friends yet, they've moved away from their family. Uh -huh. maybe they could be in a new work setting. Uh -huh. um, for folks who don't have um, a, a, a real support system around them. Uh -huh. Definitely create a plan. So while you were saying that, what came to mind for me is trying to again, in here, decide where is it I want to be. Mm -hmm. I'm in this new city. I started this new job. I don't really know any, anyone. But so what kind of people do I wish I knew? Mm -hmm. where, where do I want to go? Who do I want to be as an individual? And then go and research, you know, those types of places in your city. Work it out in your schedule. Visit those people. You know, when you're in a good mood, that's when you need to be at that spot. When you are feeling like when you are feeling the self-love, go to that spot. Mm -hmm. Go and, you know, embody who you are as an individual and be in those places and naturally, you know, engage people. When you are feeling confident, that's the most attractive trait is confidence. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, so when you are in that confident space, be around those people. And what's insane about like resiliency, and I've talked about it a lot about like the parent-child relationship, is these things that we're talking about, like listening to the kids, you know, letting them explore. We're talking about um, instead of providing punishment or frustration or projecting our own emotions, we're talking about actually teaching them, you know, a new skill or teaching them, you know, how to understand their emotions in that moment. Those, all those skills go a long way in any relationship. Mm -hmm. any relationship I don't know about you but I don't have any friendships where I don't feel that I can actually talk to them and that they will not listen to me mm -hmm. I expect all of my friends to listen to me mm -hmm. I expect all of my friends if I come up with a zany idea I expect for them to be like uh-huh yeah I don't know about this part but go for it I'm here I'm, I'm here whatever you need me to do Mm -hmm. If you need me to be up at midnight with you, give me a call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it, this, these skills literally apply to any type of relationship that we may have. And when you're talking about these happy, healthy relationships, and a big part of it is that these are the types of relationships that we are authentic. Mm -hmm. We are authentic selves in. And so I, I really feel like if we are not on a journey to find out who we are authentically. We are doing ourselves and everyone else in the world a disservice. I also think that your friends are there for you in that space in the middle of the night because they know you also respect their time and energy. So it's a, a bi-directional. Um, uh -huh, definitely. Work, right? Definitely. Absolutely. And that, again, change doesn't happen today. It started happening way before today. 
So mm -hmm. each of these, these relationships that we have, whether it be with our child, our spouse, our friends, we've been, we've been working on these things for a while. Mm -hmm. We have tested the waters several times beforehand we don't generally just hop into a situation that's going to require us to be resilient. Now, definitely there are situations. I mean, we, we've talked today about the, the recent incident. Um, there are situations where there was very little forewarning. Mm -hmm. Those things, they definitely call in our resiliency. Mm -hmm. But people who have not had moments of practice that bounce back beforehand, those are the people who will struggle immensely when these things happen. And so it really is a disservice to, to the children, to our friends, for us not to function authentically and work on this thing every single day. So if you're starting today, right? You realize you don't have a resilient child or that you are not a resilient person. Mm -hmm. What's step one? Patience. Mm -hmm. have, <laughs> create that contract. So adjustment is, adjustment is a thing. Adjustment is a thing. And unfortunately, one of the things about adjustment is that people tend to give up before change actually happens. You know, they, they say, you know, I forget what it is. I saw it not too long ago. When people try, you know, going to the gym, they, they, most people drop off within, I want to say, three or four months. This was the statistic that I saw a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about changing behaviors and building resilience, generally within three or four days, most people will drop off. But that's actually the hump. We have to push back, push past that three or four days before, mm -hmm. before they're like, okay, so this is, this new thing is, is new, right? Staying around for a while. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's staying mm -hmm. around for a while. So what is it that you need for me to do in order for me to get what I want? Cause I still want what I want. Right. So right. I understand the fit's not working anymore. Yeah. And I understand you told me you're not going to spank me anymore, mm -hmm. but I still want what I want. So what do I need to do? I'm mm -hmm. listening. Mm -hmm. So it really is, but it requires that patience because mm -hmm. when one thing that I, I talk about a lot is this whole adjustment and this hump is generally once we get to that three or four days, like we want to pull our hair out. Yeah. And it's because our, our kid is, um, they're all over the place. They're in trouble all day long. Uh -huh. And we are like, you know, we are, well, okay, well, I, maybe I don't want to do this because what we were doing before is so much easier than me pulling my hair out today because mm -hmm. I really want to lose it. Mm -hmm. What happens though is if you push past that hump, that, well, should I say, if I back up a second, on that, that third or fourth day when you're wanting to pull your hair out, it really is the kid in you trying to decide whether or not this new thing is going to stay around. Mm -hmm. it, it's one of those defining moments where it's like, tell me so I can get on board. Mm -hmm because I really want you to change and mm -hmm. go back to the way that I knew because mm -hmm. that was comfortable for me. Mm -hmm. But the resilient child, will, they will face challenges. They will go out and seek to solve problems. Mm -hmm. They will go out and offer assistance or help. They don't give up easily. So mm -hmm. how are we teaching our children to be resilient if we are not pushing past the hump? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm wondering two things. One of them about chunking things, right? Breaking them down into smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. Instead of thinking about a gigantic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thing. And then for a parent who has been doing everything for their child. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh-huh. I see those, uh, those situations oftentimes. And it's it, back to the parent. The parent is often... Um, feeling some sense of guilt in those situations where the parents kind of maybe overbearing or they are giving them gifts and things like that. There's usually an underlying sense of, of guilt. Maybe it's okay. So I wanted you to, I wanted to raise you in a household with both parents, mm -hmm. or I wanted to raise you in the, you know, the white picket fence type of situation. But mm -hmm. since I'm not able to do that, I want you to be happy. And the way that I know to do that is to buy you things. Mm -hmm. And so I have had that come into my office many times over the years. And when we're talking about doing a big thing, don't just stop buying them gifts. Just choose one thing at a time. What I do want you to do is I want you to have a conversation with your kid and explain to them, back to the verbal contract. I want you to say, hey, I now realize that that was actually not giving you what you needed. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to give you these gifts because of, and you can you know, fill in the blank because I felt guilty or because it felt good to me to see you smile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's still really important that I see you smile and I don't want to stop giving you gifts, but there are some other things that I want to teach you. Mm -hmm. So back mm -hmm. to the verbal contract, we can't it generally, 
if there if this if this hill is big and we start trying to attack it all at once, mm-hmm. we get a really big fit. Mm-hmm. A really like I've seen children um, in situations like that. All of a sudden, they are they are going leaning towards self harm mm-hmm. because we attacked the situation head on and it was just way too big. I wasn't emotionally prepared to make that adjustment. I wasn't emotionally prepared to do that shift and I need a release. Mm -hmm. So now maybe the kid is running away or they are self-harming or they're becoming extremely combative or explosive with their parents. And Mm -hmm. so back to the verbal contract, it it really needs to be a discussion. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we struggle with with even giving our kids space to have a voice in their house. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to the control. We always need to have some sense of control and in my house it's my kids playroom Mm -hmm. I don't care what it looks like Mm -hmm. that that's your area to do whatever you want Mm -hmm. as long as you are not being wasteful and spilling things you know do whatever you want Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so everywhere else we clean up but it depends on what are we all what can we agree on today Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what are you willing to do and what am I willing to do and what areas can we compromise? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And even just having that end goal in mind, what do we want this thing to look like? And I, I think um, the last presenter was saying, um, what did she say? I had it and then it left me. Oh, the why, what, what is my why? And mm-hmm. so if you know what that, that why is and what that end goal and that end re- result is that we desire, it doesn't matter if we break it up into chunks, as long as we are on the same page, as to where we are going, or you understand that this is what I am controlling, and we're going to get there regardless. Mm-hmm. It may be a little uncomfortable, but I, trust me, please, that I will support you in getting there because this is where we are going as a family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And even being able to, you know, to be humble with our children, to be vulnerable with our children, and explain to them, I may not get it right because mm-hmm. I wasn't right before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if if you can be here with me. And we can do this thing together. I I promise you, we will all be in a better space because it, we we can't be where we are now. Mm -hmm. Not, not forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if some of our listeners have some resiliency questions for you. Oh yeah. I love to answer questions. I have, um, at the, at the American Psychological Association, we have a resiliency project. And so there are, there's a a webpage, um, at hc.org backslash rez for resilience it has the books that are recommended for kids of different ages um a series of questions parents mm-hmm. can ask their kids that are um age appropriate when um, um particularly race related issues arise around resilience um but and it also sort of helps parents um with their discomfort or feeling like they have to know the right thing to say, right? Because uh-huh. lots of times we do not know the right uh-uh. thing. Um, uh-uh. And as your kids get older, they let you know that you don't know the right thing to say, which is, and you want them to have a voice in those discussions. So that's oh, definitely. Thing. Um, so um, I'm going to be saying I may not get it right because uh-huh. I wasn't right before, but we can get through this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so when you were just talking about the, um, when they get older, they will definitely tell you. My kid tells me now. He told mm-hmm. me last night, he said, can I watch some TV? Because you told me you were going to let me watch TV and you said you would keep your word. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. I do work to keep my word. But guess what? We ran out of time. You'll have more TV tomorrow. Yeah. And so it, it goes back to control. You were able to speak up beforehand and say, mommy, it's really important to me that I watch 15 minutes of TV before we go to bed. So I can I stop what we're doing right now and make sure that I do. And, and it was, he didn't say that. So it's still late. So we're still going to stick with the plan and go to bed. But what we can do is make sure that you get that time tomorrow because I do, it's really important to me that I keep my word. Mm-hmm. Back to the verbal contract and the understanding. We really do want our children, these resilient children to feel comfortable and confident in speaking their mind but also it gives them lots of practice to be able to do so respectfully. So when they are out in this community and they are being challenged by someone, they are a lot more likely to problem solve the situation instead of contributing to it, escalating and getting out of hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, So we have 
I'm wondering if you can help folks know how to get in touch with you. Do they both have questions, follow-up questions for you? Absolutely. They can definitely visit the website. It's pointsoforigin.net. That's pointsoforigin.net. And then also I'm on Facebook and Instagram and the, the handles on there are Points of Origin LLC. Oh, perfect. So, um, Shanika, I'm going to say thank you um, for um, being really informative and really helpful for parents who are um, wondering about resilience in children. And um, to uh, let everyone else know that we're going to take a break now and have more music and that we will begin our last session of the day with Erica Lewis on mindfulness strategies for the whole family. All right. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me.